Okay, there it is. That was how long it took in this session. Tommy Jade, Glizzy47. On the 47th win, I think it's a sign. I put up most of those numbers, by the way, on a flawless card. I just could I'm like throwing, man. I'm using like... I was using Perpetualis, that auto rifle, and I still couldn't lose. I set myself up for failure in every regard. Back to the default emblem. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this was so... 4 out of 5. I didn't mean to hate on the emblem like that, I'm sorry. Hey friends, today's video is about a recap of that time I got bored and decided to go for the Flawless Flawless Emblem in Trials in the solo queue playlist. And I know other people have done it, but I'm just going to tell you how I did it and maybe some tips along the way. So first off, what is the emblem? This is what it looks like on screen now. It's the Flawless Flawless Emblem. You get it by being a round ahead of your opponents always. So you have to win the first round no matter what. Then after that, as long as the enemy team doesn't increase their score line over yours, you're good to go. So for this Trials weekend, I just experimented with a lot of different builds and this background gameplay is the loadout that I found was most optimized for the job. But funny enough, I didn't even use it on this emblem run. Instead, I decided to further experiment with different loadouts to see if there was something that worked better. But now that it's all said and done, I can tell you this is the loadout for making sure that even if you have bad teammates, that there's still a chance. So let me summarize how I came to this conclusion. So over the last two months, I've been sniping a lot. I've been genuinely hitting some good shots, but whenever I'm in solo queue, it doesn't matter how good I'm sniping. If I get one pick, maybe two, it's not enough. Here's what happens. I get my pick. My teammates are in the spawn. I guess trying their best to help, right? I'm not going to shit on them too much. Then the enemy Titan throws a barricade on the body and I can't do anything about it because I already used my snipe. Sometimes I burn one of my snipes, empty primary ammo, try to break the barricade. But while I'm doing that, the third opponent swings around and starts dueling with me. So then I beat them but the other two have a revive, an overshield, and I'm down half a magazine, and all the time I'm wondering, it's been 30 seconds, where the hell is my team? But the thing is, this didn't feel like a one-off situation. This consistently felt like every other game. My teammates were letting me down by playing too safe in the back, even though they hear gunfire, even though they see the little exclamation point that says, I'm critically wounded, and worst of all, even if they see one or two kills in the kill feed, they will not leave the safety of the spawn or whatever the popular lane is. So out of frustration, I started trying other loadouts and I regressed back to double primary. And I hate to say it, it gets results. Now would I use this in an organized team of three against another organized team of three? No. But for solo queue? Every single round, there is a chance I can just 1v3 and clutch up. I feel like my chances go down with the sniper rifle for the more titans that are on the enemy team. And newsflash, even in solo queue, I still play triple arc titan or some combo of void and arc. So once I made that realization, I said, alright, if I'm not going to snipe, I still want to be lethal at a distance, so I needed to pick a scout rifle. I initially started with Jade Rabbit, and I still went back to Jade Rabbit, it was really, really good, especially in the late round when you have the perk activated and you're able to just hit body shots, and it hits 71 a body shot. It's pretty ridiculously strong, but I ran into a problem of Titan Barricades when talking the whole loadout. So I paired an SMG with Jade Rabbit, and it did okay, but Tommy's matchbook was the secret sauce, and it clicked for me. I get a kill, Titan throws a Barricade, and I use the perk to break the barricade and tag the titan. Sure, it costs my health too, but that's just an Icarus dash away from cover. And then all you have to do is jiggle peek and jump out of cover. And just try to tag them up so that they can't get the, the revive for free. And that keeps the chance of winning the round alive. So now that I'm committed to Tommy's matchbook, I need to pair a complimentary scout. I wanted to use a 150, so I tried Transfiguration. And it wasn't as good as the other option, which is going to be a 180 RPM box breathing scout, so that as long as you just hold aim down sights for a second, you have a blistering fast 3 tap at 180 RPM. And that completely catches people off guard, except 
Sometimes you don't get the three taps. Sometimes you only have enough time to put one bullet in. Then you reproc the perk and put another bullet in. And then you reproc the perk and do it again. And eventually they're cleaned up from the side. I, dare I say, for the next meta, people have been sleeping on scout rifles. They might be a bigger menace than pulse rifles. The only thing that was holding it back was no time to explain being that strong. Think about it. Like a hand cannon, we're content with that time to kill. But a 150 scout does it faster from any distance on the map. And then a box breathing 180 for the low cost of holding ADS for a second and losing that radar. A 0.67 time to kill from a neutral activation. That is wild. 150 RPM standard. 0.8, 200 RPM, 0 0.9, and 180 RPM base, one second. If anything, for the distance that a scout can cover, I think a one second TTK is fair. You're trading off damage over distance for time to kill, right? So I feel like the 150 RPMs are kind of crazy, and maybe I am calling for a preemptive nerf on that type of thing. But I'll save that for an individual video. It's just something that my finger is on the pulse with it. I think it's going to be a problem in the future. And before you overly flame me for saying that, just know I said Anteus Ward was strong two years ago or whatever. And I said Behemoth was strong two years ago or whatever. Have the videos to prove it. Same exact level of concern and wondering why aren't people using these more. Okay, so now the gameplay shifts in the background to the actual emblem run. And remember, the very, very first game, first round... I play a little riskier and dumb than usual, so I don't have too much stock in, in this one. It, it didn't go well for me, but if it failed, I would have just instantly reset and run it back. Okay, so now the second match. I think I was still trying double primary setups, and I was like, oh, Fighting Lion, this will pair perfectly with Messenger. But I ended up not really liking the loadout at all, and... You'll, you'll continue to see different loadouts throughout this emblem run, and I just kept coming back to the same conclusion. Why am I not just running the Box Breathing Scout and Tommy's? It's so much better. Okay, now I want to shift and show you the Tommy's Matchbook loadout, and then I'll finish out the rest of this gameplay after. So here's a breakdown of the build. First, you see this is specifically built for Trials of Osiris, when I initially got the Trials Emblem, I wasn't running this build. I was running something with uh, 10 Discipline, 10 Resilience, and then I think like 4 or 5 Intellect. But I realized in Trials that Intellect is the most important stat because it's the difference maker between not getting missled and then also giving your teammates a super that they'll probably end up taking to orbit anyway. The theme of this video is how to win despite not having competent teammates and that's what this build is about. Uh, to reiterate, I could start with the sniper and then switch to something like a box breathing 180. I have another one in my vault. Should be here anyway. I do have a hung jury. I just prefer the glissando because it has a highlight scope as well as the keep away perk. I do think apples to apples though that the other scout is better and you can get it this week in the nightfall. This is the rule, keep away and box breathing. Keep away is great because it gives you accuracy and range, which you do want on a scout. If I could hand craft this, I would go for the maximum amount of range, and then maybe I would still take extended mag because I do sometimes go for three taps without heat rises. So now let's talk about why I chose this stat line. It's because this specific build uses intellect mods to get my intellect to nine. And if I play against something like an Ariana's Vow, I want to be able to on the fly without losing my super, switch to 10 resilience right as we're flying into the match. And six intellect is still good, and eight discipline is still enough that you'll be able to float at the start of most rounds as long as you try to stretch your 3v1 situations. Sometimes your teammates run and die and you're put in a 1v1, so you just push with your team anyway, get the kill, that type of thing, and just accept that you're not starting the next round with a float. Now, I use Swarm Grenade because unlike the other grenades, Swarm Grenade guarantees that if I throw this on a body, the enemy team can't immediately revive it. They have to respect it for a little bit. Also, Swarm against another Well of Radiance is really, really good. 
you throw a swarm down, let it cook for a second, and then follow up with the snap. And then as soon as the snap leaves your hand, just hit him with any gun you have, and it might be enough. Another way to combat the well is Tommy's matchbook. You spin it up, you hug cover, and try to shoot the top of the well. They'll realize what you're up to, so they'll probably jump out of the well to get you. And that's when you need to break an ankle and try to just get them down outside of the well. Tommy's matchbook is amazing. It's not competitive against a mortal. That's not why you're using it. You're mainly trying to get picks with the scout rifle and then secure your pick with Tommy's matchbook. It is, I don't want to call it a special weapon, but it serves a special purpose. This purpose is breaking a Titan barricade and killing the Titan and killing the revived person. And it's going to take a lot of ankle breaking to set that up. So with Tommy's, you're not looking for the duel. You're looking to use your movement to spin up the perk safely. You don't want to be shot at when you're shooting people with Tommy's. Now, as far as the breakdown goes of the build, let me show you the perks that I typically have on this. I just default kinetic targeting. When I'm playing a session of trials, I will switch it all to strand. So, looks like solar targeting, strand targeting, solar siphon. Why solar siphon? Because when I get a double kill, drops an orb. Walk over the orb, get my health back, get some abilities back for the next round. As far as the unflinching goes, I went with one strand and two solar. I know that Glissando does have Soros Energy, but it's not easy to proc both Soros Energy and Vox Breathing, but it does. It does come up. On the gloves, I typically switch between heavy handed and dexterities, depending on if I feel like I'm going to use my melee. Snap canceling is still a thing, so I prefer Incinerator Snap. But like honestly, Celestial Fire is really good for hitting a Titan behind a barricade from across the map. Here are the fragments. Ashes for Scorch combos. If I pop Heat Rises and use Phoenix Dive and my melee, they will blow up. So pop Heat Rises, float above them, melee, Phoenix Dive down. And during the Phoenix Dive animation, Powerful Attraction collects the orb automatically as the... Um, dive finishes so sometimes you can do the combo uh, in reverse maybe from heavy handed and also pick up the orb next is searing defeat scorch targets gets a fire sprite i don't remember if they added scorch to tommy's matchbook oh maybe let's read yeah so same fire scorch is your target so yeah this has an unintentional synergy i'm using tommy's to defeat titans and it makes fire sprites. And then collecting that fire sprite grants restoration. Reviving an ally gives you restoration. Then finally, I have Ember of Torches. Some may say that this isn't worth it, but I really think it is. If I'm already popping uh, my melee to hit a Titan behind a barricade and to stop a revive, then that extra damage boost means that my Tommy's matchbook is going to compete with Immortal and it's going to break the barricade more efficiently. And it's probably going to let me pick up the double. So. That's the whole build. I could go Daybreak. If Missile wasn't so prevalent, I would probably go Daybreak. I just like the consistency of having the first well. I know that a well isn't indestructible anymore. People have a conditional finality, Wither Horde, they'll swap all. That's a subject for another video, like swapping when it's convenient in Trials, emptying a sniper, switching to Lemon Arc type thing, or right before a bubble, switching to conditional. Like, I get it you want to win i don't know if they're going to do something about that in the future but i'll save that discussion for another day still going through the perks here i think that's it uh the power weapon doesn't matter just use a grenade launcher or if you're going to craft an apex you can you can actually have an info stick roll so you can have something like this we have two perks that tell you where people are even if you don't have power ammo like a rocket inside of it. Uh, anyhow, let's move on to the gameplay. I just went ahead and left the initial Discord audio in there, just my friends and I. Like It was really a casual session, just kind of streamed it. Went on a crazy streak with Perpetualis there for a little bit. Uh, anyway, I'll uh, end the video after the seventh game, round one, and close it off from there. Thanks. Any helpers? There we go.
I mean, it's guaranteed gonna have at least a sword and have some semblance of purple on it. Yeah. Because a semblance. Which, I mean, purple's cool. I like purple. I think this does not have the range. Wow. For hidden mirror? Yeah, it doesn't. It's not made for range, it's made for building perk. Yeah, the sniper that's built for range, maybe. Might just be because I haven't. Wild. Only have one. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, I'm playing some muscle bitch. That emote screen for trials doesn't give me valuable info. Nice. Can it just be like the, the trials report card that comes out? <laughs> <laughs> the GD just flashes. <laughs> just the, everything, the fucking the entire card. Except for maybe how many wins they're on. Yeah, that would just be depressing. How can how can I read the unreadable? Oh my gosh, team. That's the all of them damaged. Let's go. Uh oh, one pick, one pick. Oh, yo, let's go. He was dead. <laughs> okay. Nightmare so, over. Un unlosable, right? Unlosable. <laughs> no, no, it's still definitely <laughs> losable. I was oh, getting, yeah. I was a little concerned there when I tagged all three of them up and nothing happened. It's 939 damage. Okay, this seems like a decent stopping point for the video, so I hope you found some valuable insight on why a double primary when I know I'm getting team balanced in, in that scenario, and I hope it's useful for you getting the emblem yourself, possibly going for it in solo queue, Though I still recommend going for it as a team, preferably as a duo. Duo is probably the easiest, and now that I'm on that subject, duo queue needs to go. Now while I am acknowledging that for a lot of duo players, it's either they duo or they don't play PvP at all. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to become two solo queuers or that they're going to find a third and play teams instead. For a lot of them, it just means that they're flat out not playing PvP anymore. So I acknowledge that that is a demographic of the PvP community, I'm saying it feels terrible from a solo perspective. Typically my duo is not skilled or communicating, and the enemy team duo is skilled and communicating, so it just feels like an impossible matchup. The whole point of solo queue in my opinion for a good player is to purposely put yourself in chaotic situations that come up because no one is communicating. That's the fun of solo queue to me. So if duo queue exists, why am I not just always queuing threes? Why am I not just always running Entei's Titan? The answer is, because I can still win in solo despite that because no one communicates. So I would much rather use the other 99% of the game and still have a chance at winning than play threes and be locked into a very hyper-specific loadout just because there are other teams doing the exact same thing because they want to win because they went through the effort of getting three people together. Duo Q throws that out the window. Now it's the same negative in both sides of the playlist. That's my POV on it. I said I wasn't going to go into it too much, it's not going to be a dedicated video, but I feel like that's a tangent worth saying, because it does feel terrible from the solo perspective. Anyhow, I will leave you on that note, and I will see you in the next one. Thanks everybody.